thanks to be here for this talk. I'm very happy to see you, because even though uh, I've been traveling before, um, it's still amazing that after one year and a half of like talking to my screen, I can still get feedback from people. I can talk to somebody, say they smile, and, and yeah, say they're frowning, or yeah. Or uh, the nodes is also very important. So when you are doing talks, it's really bad when you just talk to your screen and, well, you act like a robot, and it's not great. So we are here. If at any point you've got questions, please raise your hand. I will be very happy to be interrupted, since, again, my screen doesn't interrupt me any time. I'm Nicola Frankel. I've been a developer for 20 years. I still think I'm a developer, even though now I don't code in project. I'm coding, uh, I'm, I'm coding like prototypes and proof of concept and fun stuff uh, since I became a developer advocate a couple of years ago. Our agenda for today is the following. So first, most of all, why do we cache? A lot of people say, hey, you, you are caching. You are doing a bad job. Caching is bad, your system is badly designed. Well, I think it's a bit more involved than that. Then we will check some alternatives to keep the cache in sync with the database, because the, that's the hard problem. Then I will tell you about change data capture uh, and about one of the change data capture current implementation that is very hard called Ibizium and how it integrates with Hazelcast. And then I will finish with a, with a demo. So first, again, if you remember one thing from this talk is caching is not bad per se. You should not be afraid to cache. You should be afraid to cache for the wrong reason. But there are very good reasons to cache. And actually, I always use the same example of the microservices architecture, though I probably um, I don't advise you to use microservices at all. It's still very popular at talks and conferences, so I use this example. Imagine you have an e-commerce application and it's based on microservices. So you've got the catalog microservice, you've got the cart microservice, you've got the checkout microservice, the payment microservice, pricing microservice. So everything has been like neatly designed into their own microservice. And then your customer has put cart in their, uh, has put items in their cart, and they want to go to checkout. And you ask for the pricing microservice, the final price and there is a chance you don't get any answer. Which is very, very bad, especially in e-commerce, where you want to sell. So, in that case, it's better to cash, because it's better to have a slightly outdated price that you got before, and to sell at this wrong price, than not to sell at all and lose a sale. And perhaps lose a customer. And even if the microservice is available, it might take too long to respond. And recently I wrote an article and I have a reference in mind that Amazon, like they computed already some years ago, like a, a, a tenth of a second how much it cost them, a, a tenth of a second of latency in their response, how much it cost them, how much sales they lost. It, it's, it has a huge price. So even if you are able to contact the microservice, if it takes too long, it's better to respond and sell at the wrong price. Remember, in e-commerce, you want to sell at every cost. This is a pretty stupid application, but that will be my example for today, because yeah, I'm a developer advocate, so developer advocates, they do only hello world, and this is a pretty hello world stuff. But actually, it represents most of the system you might be using. You have an application, and yes, it works, oh, amazing. You have an application that reads and writes like from the cache, and the cache reads and writes from the database. And this is the perfect situation. The cache is always in sync, because your cache acts as a read and write facade to the database. But you work in real project. You know it never works like that. That is the ideal, but what happens in general, you have this component here that writes behind your back. And in most cases, it's normal, because this component might be a batch that updates a reference table. 
perhaps you have a list of customers, you have a list of items, you have a list of countries, I don't know. You have a list of something, your reference table, and this batch component updates it. And now if your application like, wants to read from this reference table, but reads from the cache, the cache is not up to date. That's a real problem. Who here has this problem? Ah, that's what I thought. You are in the right room. For those who don't have this problem, you still have are in the right room because some I, in the future you will encounter this problem anyway. So one of the hardest problems is how do we keep this cache in sync? And you might know about this famous quote. Yeah, you understand that when I show this slide online, I cannot see the smile on, on the, the attendee's face, so I feel that I feel dumb. I should probably remove it for online, but at least here I can see that I made you smile somehow. And uh, yeah, cache invalidation is one of those problems. And I want to dive a bit into the semantics, because we might use words that have different meanings, or actually the same word as the sa uh, different words have the same meaning, or different words, uh, well, you understand me. There, is, there are two things. The first is cache eviction, and the second is cache invalidation. And in both cases, you want to remove items from your cache. Who here has already thought it was a good idea to implement their own cache? Yeah. Who didn't? So you directly went from like the step of student to senior developer. Because I believe every junior developer in their career said, oh, that the cache is just a hash map, right? That's just, yeah, I did it. And then you realize that if you have a hash map, it, it has no size limit, though it grows unbounded, and at some point you get into trouble. So congrats to all the people who knew that before implementing it, and congrats to all the people who implemented it and learned afterwards. So in both cases, you know that we must put a hard size limit. And so you put items into your cache, and then at some point you reach the size limit, which is actually the ID and you need to cache other items, which means you need to evict entries from the cache. And then the question is, which item do we evict? There are a lot of strategies, like least recently used, least frequently used, priority, random, whatever. It can be whatever. And this is actually cache eviction. Now there is another concept where we also remove items from the cache is cache invalidation. And cache invalidation is related to time to live. That means when you put an item in the cache, you say, hmm, my guess is that this item will be valid for five minutes. And uh, it's super hard to guess how long it will be valid. So let me get back to a concrete example. I have my stupid Hello World architecture with my batch component that runs every hour. And every hour, it updates the uh, reference table. So if the time to live is actually like less than one hour, that means that I will invalidate entries and reread from the cache, though I know that the entries are still the same because the batch didn't run yet. On the opposite side, if my time to live is higher than one hour, that means that during one hour, my application will read from the cache, though the patch has run and might have updated stuff. So the question is, what is the correct time to live? It's a hard math problem. No ID. Depends. Sorry? Depends how much is uh, uh, requested. Because you could take 59 minutes to get less than an hour, but if it's fetched five minutes after the batch... It's exactly. So oh, you didn't fall into my trap. 
Actually, nobody fell because you knew there was a trap somewhere. Yeah, correct. So, correct. Actually, you have no idea when the, the items were first put into the cache, so it, it doesn't make any sense to say, oh, every hour will be fine. But it's even worse than that, because even if you say, okay, we will put all items in the cache at the hour, at the exact hour, we are talking about distributed systems, and at some point, the clock will diverge and it will be all the mess. So, doesn't solve any problem, and now we really understand that cache invalidation is the hard problem. Now I come to you with a solution. I mean, who never thought about that before? Why? I mean, let's go event driven. Instead of having like fixed, like schedule, be event driven. Meaning, if something happens, we update the cache. If nothing happens, we don't update the cache. But it's that simple. Now, when we say it's, it makes sense, and I've been an architect, so I can tell my developers, hey, like, you should just implement it, make sense, and do it. And of course, now we must go into the details, and how do you implement even driven? Well, if you have a bit of experience with a database, if I tell you even driven, you will think about database triggers. Makes sense. Well, first problem, not all databases implement triggers. A lot of them do, but not all. Hmm. Okay, forget about it. Let's assume that our database have triggers. Okay, great. But the problem is that triggers are generally meant to update the data inside of the database. And now we want to update the cache, which is outside the database. So for the talk, I did a bit of research. And I will take a simple example, which is MySQL, which has triggers. And actually, it also allows to call external processes. And now comes the not fun part. Uh, who here is a C++ expert? Yeah, that's my, yeah, yeah. that's also my position. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to somebody else. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. You must be a C++ expert because, of course, you need to write your, your stuff in C++, and I don't know about the tooling. I not, don't know nothing. Um, then you have requirements on your operating system. Then pff, you have a lot of constraints. Not great. But now I dug a bit further, and I found a GitHub project. And actually... This GitHub project already has an existing generic call, a generic library for that called sysexec. So you actually only need to write the command line that you need to execute. Perfect. Yeah, I, as I told you, I, I was an architect before, and it seems to me there are a couple of issues with that. The first is, I narrowed it down to a single database in a single version. Okay, so this is very implementation dependent. Then the biggest problem, it's super fragile. I mean, I wouldn't build an information system based on this. I basically, I, I don't trust it. I mean, I didn't even check if the GitHub project was maintained. I didn't even check if the GitHub project was maintained. What was its bus factor? Perhaps it's very well maintained, but there is a single person behind. And if it gets hit by a bus, not great. That's the reason why it's called a bus factor. Yeah, that's sad, but that's true. And if you have done triggers in the past, you know that it will be very resource consuming. But assuming everything works fine, now imagine there is a bug in the whole chain. We are working in people's organization. And here, we are actually using, like, I don't know how your organization is actually organized, but there is a high chance you have developers, you have DBAs, you have ops. Who here has, like, teams that you build it, you run it? Wow. Ama wow. Half of the room. That's really, really good. Then it could work for you. But now the question is, would you trust this? That's 
my point. <laughs> so either you are in traditional organization and okay, you might decide let's do it and then it, when the, a problem happens, then it will be the blame game or you are like self-responsible and you really don't want to trust that because there is a high risk that you will be called at 2 a.m. in the night and you don't want that because you have a life, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's try something else. Who has heard of change data capture before? A couple of hands, let's say one third of the room. So here is the Wikipedia uh, definition. I won't read it to you, you can read it already. Uh, I like to define change data capture as the opposite of event sourcing because people in general know event sourcing already. So even in event sourcing, what you are doing is you are storing the events in your data store and when you want to know about the state of the system, you replay the events in order. Like you have these like very simple bank account examples, you have the event account opening, then you probably have the first event, you have probably have like credit, because you cannot get debit if you just open the account. Then you have whatever, debit, credit, debit, credit. You want to know the balance, you replay everything. Hey, you've got your balance. It was quite popular, I still think it is, but the problem is it doesn't play nice with existing leg legacy systems, because that means that you need to change your data store entirely, and the traditional databases, they are not really great for that. Change data capture, reverse this issue, you keep your information system, you still store the state, but every time you change the state, you will get an event out of it which I believe is much more pragmatic. And probably you already implemented change data capture before. Like the, the first three rows are polling, so batch plus something, so a timestamp, a version, a status that you update later. Who has ever done that? Yeah, so you already did in change data capture. Of course, the problem is you need to run at a scheduled time, and in general, in batches, yeah, it's hours or whatever. Triggers on tables seems to be also a change data capture, but the, the really popular stuff right now is, is log scanners. So perhaps you are aware of log scanners, and perhaps you are aware of this article by uh, Martin Kleppmann on the Confluent blog. It, uh, he, he tells about the database, and he tells about, hey, this is what the database is for a developer. It's just an endpoint when you send SQL requests and statements. So you make changes, you read data. And the SQL itself, the SQL specification, doesn't tell you anything about what lies behind the blob. But actually, if you are, if you are an ops or if you, are, you build it to run it, you, you must know what happens if your database go down, you don't want it to go down. So in general, you have at least replication, even if in old SQL databases, you have replication. And how does this replication work? Well, you've got the stream here, like something that happens. And how is this stream implemented? It's implemented through a file. So there is a log, and when I say it's a log, it's just an append-only file that every time you've, you've got a change like statement, like delete, insert, whatever, you write it down in the file. And then you've got the two nodes, the leader and the follower, and both will read from the log. And so both will execute the statements in the same order and they will arrive at the same state. And of course, there is a chance that the log is located closer to the leader so that the follower might lag a bit behind. So that's eventual consistency, welcome to distributed systems. But it still does the trick. So if the leader fails, the follower will be in the same state that is expected by all others. And actually, you can also have a single node that implements it, 
So I have this binary file. It writes the stuff, and if it fails, it will restart the process. It will read from the log, so you won't have lost any data. So even well, for a single node architecture, it might be a good idea. Doo -doo. What if we used it? So here is the MySQL bin log. I hope you like cryptic stuff. Um, you can see the update here, so you can understand that. Where is also pretty cool. Uh, then you've got a garbage, then set, okay, then more garbage, then really, really a lot of garbage. So unless you've got the reset test on, it's going not to be super fun. Uh, to remind you something, right? Nothing has changed. It's still hacky, but I didn't find anything on, on GitHub. Uh, and that's the same problems that I addressed. But now comes the savior, Debezium. And Debezium is actually a Java library that does it for us. So it's an abstraction layer, just as GDBC is an abstraction layer. You've got an API, and you change the driver when you want. Debezium is an abstraction layer that allows you to have a single API, whatever, well, in a limited set of databases. And about the fact that it's not maintained or blah, 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 uh, Red Hat is behind it, which is much better than Google, if you catch my drift. Can you cut it when you produce it? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, this is how Debezium was designed at the beginning. The beginning is it was meant to play with Kafka. So the idea was, hey, you've got your Kafka a cluster, you've got your topics, whatever happens here, hey, I have my connector, I will write into one or multiple topics. That was the idea. It still works like that. But would it make sense to put a Kafka cluster behind our database, which actually stores the state, and our cache, which actually is meant for fast data access? Uh, just as a parenthesis, I see a lot of talks mentioning Kafka, that they solve all their problems with Kafka. Be careful about that. Uh, there is no magic pill. Kafka has use cases, a lot of use cases. Uh, but between a cache and a database, no, it has no use case. As I mentioned, um, Debezium uh, relies on connectors, and a couple of connectors are already in production, and I believe that already addressed like 95% of the market, especially the legacy market where you've got a lot of SQL databases. Uh, some of them are incubating, and some of them are already provided by uh, the community. So in my slide here, I'm missing a community one. It seems that uh, SkillaDB or SillaDB, I don't know how it's pronounced in English because I'm French and never use this word. Um, I can read it though. Um, uh, has implemented their own connector for Debezium. So if you are using Skilla or SillaDB, you can already benefit from change data capture. Yes, this is an exclamation mark, because who would have thought that DB2 has such a connector? <laughs> so who, who asked the question? Thanks, yes. This is an exclamation mark. I was very surprised. Are you surprised too? Yeah, so yeah, great. So yeah, and it's production ready. So if you are stuck on, on those old legacy systems, you can still benefit from, from, from it. Um, I work for a company called Hazelcasts, um, so I didn't introduce the company before, but I will be using it in the demo, so I, I, it's time uh, I, I tell it, uh, which uh, provides a platform. Who knows about Hazelcast before? Wow. Okay, who knows about Hazelcast IMDG? Uh, okay. So in general, when I ask people and they know about Hazelcast, they think about in-memory data grid, IMDG. And in general, inside this whole in-memory data grid, you are using IMAP, like key value store, to cache. Actually, we had another product called JET, which did data streaming, and with Hazelcast 5.0, we merged both. 
So now you have a platform that is able to do like in-memory data store, like here, and in-memory stream processing. We also have connectors, oh, -ho, database events. Mm -hmm. And then we have also syncs. Ah, it got, oh, it doesn't work anymore. Ah, interesting. Um, here, we, sorry, we, we have things, and one of them is hassle costs. So imagine if we have our cache in hassle costs, which I will do, of course, and we can stream the database events, we can, with hassle costs, put everything into the cache as soon as there is a change in the database. Hazle cost has two deployment models. Um, if you are a Java developer, in general, you use the first one because then it's very easy. It's just a single uh, dependency that you, you bring into your application. It's just a jar. Then when your application starts, you start the uh, node as well. Or if you are using Spring Boot, you just configure it and it, it, it starts it for you. And what happens, there is an auto-discovery mechanism and then we make a cluster and that's super, super easy. But I believe that's not the, if you, if you start to rely on it on production, I believe that you should like really separate the couple because you will compete for resources here. And now I have somebody behind me, which makes me very uncomfortable. I'm very <laughs> no, I am joking, sorry. Um, I, I, I'm French, I joke too much perhaps, uh, sorry. Um, so yeah, you should decouple your cluster from your application, your separation of concerns. And on the good side, you can also have clients in different languages, like Java, C Sharp, C++, Go, Python. So it's, it's a benefit. How does it work? Well, first, all, probably all stream processing engines, they work the same. Here I'm using the semantics of Hazel cost, but if you are using something else, probably it will be like very similar to what you know. Uh, first thing you need to do is you write the code, and the code says, hey, I will be reading there, I will be writing there, and in between I will make transforms in general, or filters or whatever, whatever operation you want to do. Then you package that, and then you send it to the stream processing engine. The stream processing engine will then, because it knows about the topology of the cluster, it will send the code to nodes and it will be able to parallelize the work. And guess what? Now we can solve our problems. So this is still the same Hello World application with my uh, stupid component here. Uh, but what I will be doing, I will be having like an additional job here that will read from the bin log of the database and you write to the cache. So every time my component updates the database, it will be written to the cache. And I've talked a lot and let me do some demo. Is there any question at this point that I can answer? Yes. It could be. What's the difference between a cache and a database? Okay. The question is stupid, but not that stupid. Uh, the cache is close to the application. Close to the application? Ah, closer, you mean, yeah? So it has faster data access, yes? It could be, but if you are using a key value store as a data store, that's not even true. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. You see, all the criteria that you, have, that you have told so far, they might be correct, but they don't hold true as a criteria. I don't know. I, ah, I did something very bad. I stepped on a cable. Help! <laughs> no, it's back, sorry. Sorry, I, I will put that where it belongs. <laughs> um, it lives in memory. So that difference, 
That's a good question. Um, I prefer to, to, to shy a bit away, to move a bit away from the talk because it's an interesting conversation. Because I ask myself the same question. So the criteria is that here it lives in memory and a real, uh, sorry, here it lives in memory and here it, it lives on this, correct? That's your criterion. Well, there are some databases that live in memory and when you shut them down, they persist to disk. Is that, is that a cache or is that a database in that case? I'm asking you the question. Why wouldn't you exclusively? Uh, because we are like, especially me, like I'm old, I'm settled to my ways, I like to use a SQL database and the cache, but no, the question is really interesting. In some cases, then perhaps doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Is the regions each person in the, the, the database has to capture the... Now, Debezium is a library that runs here. Actually, we are wrapping the Debezium API uh, so that you, you don't need to use the Debezium API. You just use the Hazelcast API. I will show you the code, okay? Show me the code, and it's written here. Talk is cheap, show me the code. So, first thing first, IntelliJ, because I'm still a developer, or at least I pretend to do, to be. Um, I have a Docker Compose file. So first, I have the application that I will show to you just afterwards. I have the pipeline, and I will switch it off at the beginning, because I want to show you how bad it can be. How long do I have still? How long? Eight minutes? Eighteen. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> the, yeah, this is, uh, I won't show you, it's a dashboard for Hazelcast, but it's not open source, so I prefer not to show it. And then there is a database, okay? I will start it. And you can see that I tried this morning, just to be sure, because it happens sometimes that I try and eh, it doesn't work. Um, so now it st starts everything. I will stop the pipeline, docker, oops, docker compose, stop, pipeline, Doop. okay, and now, now you will understand why I'm a developer and not a designer, yes, <laughs> thanks, you laughed, he said amazing, I, I don't know which is more ironic. Um, yeah, this is a very stupid application, and uh, how it's done, it, it, sorry? People, plural persons, people. <laughs> now you can tell a lot of stuff about my design skills, but if you start like implying that I don't speak English correctly, now I will be very unhappy. <laughs> Especially I'm French, you know, I already have this, pr this complex. Okay, the application, but okay. You can make a pull request, this is on GitHub. Um, this is a Spring Boot application. Okay, who here doesn't know anything about Spring Boot? Yeah, okay. So, stupid application, I have two endpoints. The first one is a get mapping. It, it loads every entity from the database, like find all. And I have a post mapping, so I click on the update button it will like update this line and then it will redirect to the first endpoint. So I have the, the, the post redirect get pattern. Okay? Nice. The person repository is not a Spring Data repository because I wanted to like pretend that I was doing like Hibernate, so I have two caches. The first one is a query cache. So when I do a request for find all, First, I create my query, which of course is the same. And here, it's person without an S. And the first thing that I check is, is there a key that corresponds to this like a request in the first cache, in the query cache? If there is nothing, then I will do the request. And for every entity, I will put them in the entity cache. Then afterwards, I will put in the query cache the list of keys which is how Hibernate works. Then, if 
I already found the request, and it's simple because it's always the same request, so here it will be uh, like a, a, a cache with one single entry. I will get the keys, and for the keys, I will take the keys from the entity cache. Then when I want to save something, I just put everything into the entity cache. Okay? Somebody wants to tell me that I'm doing dual writes, that it's wrong, it is but it will be the subject for another talk. Okay, this is how it works. So what now when I want to say, hey, Johnny, update, it works, amazing. Now, I don't have any pipeline and I have a, a batch. So here I don't have a batch, I have an update application. So I can directly change the database without going through the application. So I can list, the stuff in the database, here, Johnny, Jane, John, and I can do like crazy stuff. So I will change the third row, the first name to Robert. And of course, my stupid application still reads from the cache because it believes that, hey, it's, it's John. And that's what I don't want. So now I will be launching my pipeline. And the pipeline is here. So now I will stop the pipeline, and now we can see how easy it is to write a pipeline. Nope, here, here. So first, it's a regular application. It's not a spring uh, anything. It's just a regular application. I'm using Hazelcast. I'm using the Debezium uh, connector. I'm using the like connect change data capture with MySQL, and that's all. How does it look like? As I mentioned, it's a regular application, so there is a main class here. I just need to wait because sometimes it takes too long and I need like to wait for my SQL. And this is what I told you. So here I'm not, I'm, I'm running embedded. I don't have a dedicated cluster because it's, it's for a demo. And I will submit a new job. And first I need to create the pipeline and the pipeline is the following and I love how easy it reads because, hey, I read from the database without the timestamp. Peak is to write in the log. I map to a person and then to a map entry and I write to the cache. You can send it to your business analysts. It's that simple. Okay, you might say, hey, but because the complexity is in the database, uh, well, so here, this is like Hazelcast API. And you can see everything is related to configuration. Not a single real line of code. Everything is about like configuring, hey, I will be running in this environment, so I need to know where the host is, where the port, blah, blah, blah. Nothing mind-blowing here. OK, but then the complexity is in writing to the cache. Well, not really. Again, I write to a remote cache, so I just need to configure, hey, this is where the place where I want to write. Done. And then, okay, but mapping function, that, in, that, that might be hard. Well, not really. This is my first mapping function. This is my second mapping function. I mean, even if you are not a Java developer, you can probably understand it. Because the transformation is simple. I need to extract the value from the payload. Here, I have a change record. That is a Hazelka stuff. Change record is made of a header and a body. Well, it's called the value. Change header and change value. I take the change value. I, well, I take the change record. I get the value and I transform it to an object of class person. Done. And here I just, util.entry is just a nice way to extract the ID from an existing entity so I don't need to write a, hash, um, a function that gets the key and gets the ID. Okay, now the pipeline has started. Now if I like refresh, of course, I get the data. So it was able to catch up the changes that happened before it started, which is good. And now, of course, even better, every time I do a change, um, note here, here, I will change uh, line to uh, update to, to Chiara.
Now, every time there is a change, I've got my data. So the application always has the right data. Amazing. So in this talk, I try to explain you the caching trade-off. And then I showed you that eh, you don't need to choose. You can cache and still have the correct data. You can have your cake and eat it too with the help of Hazel and Debezium. So thanks a lot for your attention. You can read my blog. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, if the code was, uh, I went too fast, then you can get it on GitHub. If you want to fix my English mistakes, you are welcome to do some PRs. And if I got you interested in Hazelcast, uh, yeah, join our Slack. Or if you want some free training, you can also get it without talking to anybody, which is cool, believe me. Any questions? Yes. That's, that's, that's uh, an orthogonal concern. You still have the same issues that you, you need to have a, a limit. You need to have a limit. But here it was about the changing data. The problem with like outdated cache is not in the fact that the data isn't in the cache and you need to fetch it because then you lag a bit, but you've got the data might be that you deleted something and you can do it with Hazelcast as well, and it's still in the cache. But again, I, I didn't show it, but you, you can manage it. But the real problem is, hey, the data is in the cache, but it is not the same as in the source of truth, which is the real problem. E eviction is, uh, an, in my opinion, an autonomous concern. So you, you, you still need to do whatever you, you did before. So first, you, you, um, I, I, I don't know if I, I answered the question, but it's, it's different. With inverse, what you are basically, you are snapshotting your entities. So it takes more space in your database, in your legacy database, which actually I did use inverse is, well, at the time it was really cool and, and there might be use cases for it. But in general, what happens, perhaps, I mean, it really depends on the use case, but what happens is you don't need to like, have the, like, the, the whole history of the whole entity. What you want in this use case, you, I don't want the history, I just want to be made aware when it changes. So it depends on the use case. Yes? Database replication can be synchronous as well as asynchronous? Yes. Can I set the whole pipeline in? So you're going through a couple of steps. Yes. So TDC. Yes. Um, Hazelcast uh, and application call. Yes. Can you do all of that synchronously? That's the problem that, in general, you don't want to do that. Because, yes, you can synchronize everything, but then it defeats the purpose of the cache, which is to get fast. So in that case, we have a slight window where the cache data is not in sync with the source of truth because it takes time for the, data, the data to arrive. But we are talking about distributed systems. Even light takes time to move. So there is no such thing as instant replication, as zero time. Zero time. It doesn't exist. It's a marketing concept. The only thing that we did here, and I believe it's a huge improvement, is we drastically reduced the window of the synchronization. Again, distributed systems. And, well, you, 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 you can fight it all your life, probably you will probably lose against the speed of light. Yes? Uh, normal application which is distributed as in multiple nodes, 
because that's our current problem. We have one application, it runs the DB, no one else, but to have a distributed cache, uh, we don't. We have only in-memory caches for now, because everything else, of course, it's hard, so we didn't do it yet, because we can live without it. I really need more details because you can have like local in-memory caches, you can have like distributed in-memory cache. It has trade-offs. So um, if you want to talk a bit more uh, before I, I catch my train, we can talk a bit about it if you want. But I'm not a consultant anymore. I, I was a consultant for 17 years. I left just to do Hello World applications in front of people. Huh? Because people never listened to me before. So. <laughs> no, at least perhaps if you if you don't listen, then it's your problem, it's not mine. Anymore. Other questions? Yes. No. Again, you need to understand your trade-offs. So first, dual writes are bad. Because you're never sure that one will work and not the other. So if you really want to make sure that the data that you write in the cache and the data that you write in the database are in sync, you need to have transactions, locks, which again defeats the caching purpose. What is more important to you in general? The database. <laughs> so that's the really, really important thing. And then if you don't manage to write in the cache, which in general is not that frequent, then too bad. If you don't manage to write in the cache, but too bad. With CDC, it's not an issue because if you write in the database, it will get back eventually. Yeah, I see a lot of, this opens new possibilities. I agree. You can do a lot of crazy stuff. With this kind of stuff, you can do a lot of, of crazy. Uh, in another talk, I'm using it to do zero downtime deployment, to synchronize two databases together while the people are still using it. In another crazy talk, I did like bytecode streaming. So I have a running JVM, I have my file system, I change this, my, I compile, then it gets the bytecode and it stream it into the new JVM. Yeah, you can do a really a lot of crazy, crazy stuff. Um, so you have a lot of problems, you are really working people, you are not doing Hello World application. Um, this is just one more tool in your tool bed. It doesn't solve all the problems in the world, of course, like everything, it's not the silver bullet. But I believe that it can help you in a lot of ways that when you start like not reasoning in batches, but reasoning in streaming, you can have a lot of solutions that were hidden before. Uh, if there are no more questions, then I think that I'm done. I have stickers. Do you like my t-shirt? Yeah. yeah, I do also. <laughs> so I don't have t-shirts, unfortunately, but I have the next best, best thing. I have the same, but with stickers. So thanks a lot, and enjoy the rest of the conference.